Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Professor Taniguchi, for your uh, introductory remarks, and also for the opportunity to join you here today for this very important symposium. In previous symposia, this is number four, uh, previously there have been presentations focusing on particular cities and particular transport systems. What I would like to do is to take a step back and look at the context in which we think about transport and the way in which we come up with transport solutions, as I believe this wider context influences the possibilities that we think of for making our cities and our transport systems more sustainable. So I'm going to focus on talking about the context in which we do transport planning and the context in which we design streets. And I'm going to concentrate on four points. First of all, to say that there are different strategic perspectives on transport and travel that we have adopted over the last 50 years, each of which has different implications for the problems that we observe in our transport systems and the solutions that we come up with. Secondly, that if we are to have more sustainable transport, we need to recognise the wider context in which transport operates. The decisions that other sectors make have an influence on travel behaviour and constrain the ways in which we can make lives and movement more sustainable. Thirdly, I want to focus down from the strategic view to looking at streets in our cities and how new thinking about transport can shape the way in which we design our streets to make them more sustainable. And then I would like to end with a few brief conclusions. So first of all, talking about a strategic perspectives on travel. If you look at any profession or any discipline, it works within a particular paradigm, a particular view of the world that shapes and influences the issues that are perceived and described. It affects the problems, uh, the way they are diagnosed, and the way they are prioritised. And also, this paradigm affects the solutions that are generated and evaluated. If you like, the, the particular spectacles that we put on through which we observe the world influences what we see and how we might solve problems. And if we look broadly across science and social science, advances in our thinking often happen through what are called paradigm shifts. Sometimes these are sequential, one paradigm then another. Sometimes there are conflicting paradigms in operation at the same time. So, for example, in the medical profession, um, we can contrast the, the Western medical paradigm, which is concerned very much with the physical structure of the body and drugs and so on, and a traditional Western paradigm, which is much more concerned about the, the flow of energy in the body, acupuncture, things like that. So there can be different ways of viewing the world that can be in conflict. Although this hasn't been discussed very much, what I want to argue is that the paradigm is also very important in transport because the way we view transport affects uh, very many aspects of transport policy and transport solutions, although this is something that we haven't discussed very much. And looking back over the last 50 years, I would suggest that we can identify a core vehicle-based paradigm in the centre, P1, and over time there have been four successive enlargements of that perspective uh, from P1 out to P5. Each enlargement was triggered or stimulated by some limitation with the existing view of the world. And this is probably very familiar to you. Uh, this is a, a sort of visual uh, display that when you look at it, you can see two different things. Sometimes you see two faces looking at each other. Sometimes you see a candlestick. 
And the point I'm trying to make is you can look at the same reality and you can look at it in different ways and see different things in that same reality. And that's what's happened in transport over the last 50 years. We've seen the world differently and that's affected what we've seen and the solutions that we've come up with. So these briefly are what I would argue are the five perspectives and I'll just briefly go through each one. From the 50s or 60s, our predominant view of transport in cities was a concern with vehicles. And our main priority was to cater or provide for the movement of vehicles. That was very successful when car ownership was quite low, but as car ownership grew, it became obvious that we could not provide enough space in cities for everybody to make every journey by car. And so we broadened our approach and said that as transport planners, we're not just concerned about moving vehicles around the city, we're actually concerned about moving people around the city. And therefore, our main interest now is to cater for person movement by various modes of transport, bus, train, cycle, walking, and so on. Then, in the 70s and 80s, people started looking more basically at travel and said, actually, travel is a drive demand. People don't travel for the sake of travelling, they travel because they want to take part in different activities in the city. And so the emphasis now changes again to not to cater for vehicles or not to cater for person trips primarily, but to enable people to move around the city to take part in different activities in the city. And on top of that, we've had two further perspectives or elements uh, in our view of transport. One is to recognise the dynamic nature of behaviour, that behaviour changes over time. It's not constant, that traffic systems change over time, and we have to be able to uh, understand and react to that something like, for example, earthquakes uh, cause a sudden change in the system that we have to be able to adapt to. And also the importance of attitudes and the influence of perceptions and attitudes on people's behaviour. Now, each of these new perspectives has brought a wider range of disciplines and professions into transport, so that the original vehicle-based perspective was very much based on the view of engineers. It was an engineering problem to provide for motor vehicles. When we broadened our interest to think about people moving around the city and person trips, uh, people such as economists became involved in trying to organise movement efficiently. Then, when we looked, took an activity-based perspective, that involved people from geography and people from planning who brought in their ideas to uh, under, help us understand how to deal with the requirements of people in cities. When we moved on to look at dynamics, then uh, people in marketing and in the financial sector had experience in these areas and also became involved. And obviously, as we took a greater interest in attitudes, then uh, psychology and psychologists became important contributors to our understanding of transport. Hmm. Sorry. Okay. Now, each of these different perspectives actually um, puts different requirements on us as researchers, uh, for example, in terms of data collection. So when we're looking at vehicle movements, we have to rely on data from roadside counts and from uh, surveys of vehicle movements. When we became interested in person trips, then we had to ask households to uh, fill in travel diaries so that we could also look at walking and cycling trips as well as trips by car or by public transport. When we became interested in, in activities, we had to ask households to fill in activity diaries and time use surveys. In order to study dynamics, we have to track behaviour over time and therefore start using panel surveys. And 
if we want to understand people's attitudes and perceptions, we have to start collecting data using attitude surveys. So these different perspectives uh, actually put different requirements on data collection and also on in analysis and, and modelling. What's particularly important for our discussion today, though, is that each of these perspectives identifies the transport problem differently and comes up with different solutions. So, for example, if we look at transport from the point of view of vehicles, then the obvious solution is to increase road capacity and provide more parking space in order to accommodate more vehicles. If we look at the problem from the point of view of person trips, then our focus switches to looking at alternative modes um, providing better public transport and also introducing traffic restraint to encourage people to switch from car to bus and rail. When we think about providing for uh, activities in cities, then we can focus on ways of reducing the need to travel uh, and also using teleservices, teleshopping, telebanking and so on, so that we can have more sustainable living by reducing the pressure on the transport system. If we look at transport from a dynamic point of view, then we recognise that there are long-term trends. Uh, for example, we know that uh, in relation to bus fares, for example, people, people's long-term response to a bus fare increase is roughly twice their short-term response. And we can also target interventions, policy measures, at particular points in people's lives. When we take on board the importance of attitudes, then that enables us also to provide information and marketing as a way of trying to encourage more sustainable travel behaviour. Let's take a particular example. Let's say that we want to introduce policies to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. How do these different perspectives come up with different solutions to the aim of reducing CO2 emissions? Well, from a vehicle perspective, um, we can encourage people to, uh, to build and to buy more fuel-efficient vehicles. That reduces CO2. From a person-trip perspective, we can encourage people to switch from car to lower carbon modes, such as uh, train or cycle or walking. From an activity perspective, we can encourage people to use teleservices. Instead of travelling somewhere to a bank, to actually a bank online using the internet, or to trip chain so that people don't make journeys from home to go shopping, a separate journey to work, but they trip chain, they link things together and therefore travel more efficiently. From the point of view of dynamics, we can target our policy interventions at particular decision points in people's lives um, when they are more likely to be willing to change their behaviour and also recognise that policies take time to build up over time. So, for example, um, if we encourage more fuel-efficient cars, people only change their car every few years, so it will take some years before that policy works through the system. And from an attitude point of view, we can encourage voluntary behaviour change, uh, voluntarily get people to reduce their car use, and also to encourage eco-driving, where people drive more carefully and use less fuel. So the point I'm making is that the, there are various different ways in which we can see, look at transport, and over the years we've enlarged our different perspectives on transport, and that has increased the possibilities we have for instruments, policy measures, to actually uh, encourage more sustainable travel behaviour. The second thing, so the first thing is about context. Uh, and understanding different perspectives on travel, opening up new opportunities for dealing with sustainable travel. The second thing I want to talk about is the fact that transport is not something in isolation. It's part of a much bigger economic and social system. 
And in order to deliver sustainable transport effectively, we need to understand this broader context. And there are several aspects to this. First of all, we need to recognise that if we introduce a transport policy or a transport measure, it can have a wide-ranging impact socially, economically and environmentally. So almost anything we do in transport will have a, w a range of impacts for the economy, society and the environment. Secondly, that if we look at changes over time, we find that changes in travel patterns co-evolve alongside social and economic and technological developments. So these go hand in hand. Changes in travel don't happen in isolation. They're part of bigger changes in society and the economy. And the third point I want to make is that non-transport policy decisions made by health sector, education sector and so on can have major impacts on travel behaviour. Okay, this diagram here tries to set in context, a broader context, the, the impacts of transport policy. So if we start off with a black box where we have a proposed measure or an existing situation, for example, maybe we are planning to improve the public transport system or to introduce congestion charging or something. Any policy like that will have a series of impacts, which some of which are environmental, for example, maybe leading to improved air quality or reduced CO2 emissions. Some will be economic, either leading to more efficient travel or in some way helping to improve the productivity of the economy. And some will be social in terms of enabling some groups to better access health care or education and so on. And if we want to carry out a, a full economic analysis, then we can put monet monetary values on each of these impacts. So if our policy improves air quality, we can put a value on the improvement in air quality. If our policy improves access to health care, we can put a value on that improvement to health care. And if our policy enlarges labour markets and enables more people to get to skilled jobs, then we can put a value on that for the productivity of the economy. So a transport policy can have much wider benefits across the whole economy. Uh, and these, if we capture these benefits, it helps us to make the case for investing in transport policies. At the same time, different policies have different distributional impacts. Almost any policy will affect social groups differently. Some will gain more than others. It will also expect, affect areas spatially. Some parts of the city will benefit more from a new railway line than other parts of the city. And also it will affect, have different impacts temporarily as well. Uh, it may have greater impacts at weekdays and weekends. It may have bigger impacts in the summer than the winter, and so on. Or it may be that when there's a major disruption, uh, that that's when the investment will really be become valuable. So the point I'm trying to make simply is that it's a bit like putting a pebble in a pond. The ripples go out that a major transport policy has lots of impacts across the economy, affecting different groups in society, and we would also hope benefiting the environment as well. And the more we understand this, the more we can select policies that are most effective at increasing sustainability and well-being, and the stronger the case we can make for investment in transport policies. The second thing I want to talk about in terms of our understanding of travel is that transport is not something in isolation. It's embodied, it's part of, embedded rather, in a wider social technical context. And recent academic research has identified what are called socio-technical clusters where different things come together 
to make, enable a change to take place. And that in our society, major changes in behaviour often arise from simultaneous changes in social and business practices and technologies in several sectors. So that we may, any change we observe in travel, whether it's in personal travel or logistics or whatever, is often due to a whole series of developments across the economy and society that come together in new ways and provide new opportunities for carrying out behaviour. And I want to give a simple example of changes in retail shopping patterns over time. This first social technical cluster um, represents the situation that you would have found uh, certainly in Western Europe and I guess in, in Japan for much of the 20th century. That when people went shopping, they would go to small specialist shops, uh, a butcher to buy their meat, a grocer to buy their vegetables and fruit, and these would largely be served by local producers, local farms or local businesses and so on, who would transport their goods to the local shops. And then most households would visit those shops on foot every day, taking the goods that they purchased from the different shops uh, to their home where they would consume them. And in order to do that, they would pay for those goods by cash. So this is the pattern perhaps through most of the 20th century, daily shopping on foot to small local specialist shops. So their daily travel on foot is part of a wider pattern of how um, goods are delivered to shops and taken from shops to people's homes. If we look towards the latter part of the last century, as car ownership grew substantially, and as markets became more global through better international transport systems, through um, more efficient shipping, through uh, larger aircraft, and through the introduction of global uh, distribution systems, then we move over to a new pattern of behavior, whereby goods are not mainly coming locally, they're coming from all around the world through major distribution, global distribution centres, and then are delivered not to corner shops, but to large supermarkets, where people with cars would typically visit the supermarket once a week, stock up with their goods, and then take them home. But in order for that to happen, first of all, it has to be possible to build large supermarkets rather than just small shops. And also, people need to have a fridge freezer at home because without a fridge freezer, for much of the year, it's not possible to buy fresh fruit and meat and so on and milk and keep it preserved at home for a week or so without a fridge freezer. And here, people still go to the supermarket and pay by cash, but they can also pay by credit card. So we've moved from daily trips on foot to weekly trips by car, but as part of a bigger change in, in the whole technical and social system. And then the new pattern that's emerging now, based on the use of the internet, is the possibility it offers for people to shop online using the internet, so they don't need to travel at all. They don't need to travel on foot, they don't need to travel by car for shopping, they can just do it from home, where they can contact the uh, the distribution center where the goods are delivered directly to their home. Again, they have the fridge freezer so that they can store the goods for a, a week or two. And now, payment is by credit card, not by cash. So for this system to operate, not only do we need the internet, but we need to have electronic money in order for this system to operate. So to summarise, I've tried to summarise in the table here what's going on. If we look on the right-hand column, we observe three different travel patterns. The first one, daily collection of uh, groceries and other goods on foot by walking. The second pattern, 
weekly collection of goods by car. And the third pattern, deliveries directly to people's home. So these are three different travel patterns, on foot daily, by car weekly, and then deliveries uh, once a week, once a fortnight to people's homes. But to make that happen, a whole series of other changes have had to happen in society, involving many technological changes. So in the first uh, example, where people shop locally on foot, then they visited local stores that uh, were made of brick and wood, just small buildings made of brick and wood. When we move on to supermarkets, large supermarkets, you cannot construct those on a big scale just from brick and wood, so we relied on new building technology. The use of steel frame and cladding was necessary in order to move over to large supermarkets. At the same time, that linked up with moving from local distribution and local collection of goods to global systems. And similarly, when we move from the collection of goods weekly by car to deliveries to the home, we also need the internet and we also need uh, to have electronic money to do that. And in terms of storage, if we had not invented fridge freezers, we would still be mainly relying on daily shopping from local sources, and we would not be able to transport fresh produce around the world on any scale without freezer technology or fridge technology. So you can see that developments outside the transport system, developments in building construction, developments in uh, preserving food through the fridge freezer, developments in the internet and electronic banking have all contributed to the possibility of changing our travel behaviour. So the change in travel behaviour is not simply due to um, changes within the control of the transport system, they're part of much broader changes in society. The third example I want to give in terms of needing to look much more broadly to understand why travel behaviour changes and how we can influence change in travel is to comment on how strategic policy decisions taken in non-transport sectors in health, education, financial sector, etc. can have a major influence on the demands placed on transport provision uh, the demands put on the transport system and also the demands put on other sectors. So decisions made by one sector have major, can have major impacts on uh, the operation of other sectors in the economy. The problem for transport planners is that transport is often overlooked and it's only once these other sectors have made, a, uh, made their major decisions that transport becomes involved. Typically in the UK, for example, um, if a health authority decides to build a new hospital on an out-of-town location because it's more efficient medically, it doesn't usually consult the public transport operator until it's already designed the site. And by that time, it can, it can sometimes be too late to redesign the road network so it can easily be served by buses. So we end up with a system, a new hospital on a purpose-built site but can't be well served by, pub by buses because transport was not considered at the beginning of the process, only at the end of the process. And this diagram here shows another example um, of the decision taken by one sector, in this case the education sector, having major impacts on other sectors including the operation of transport. And the thing to note here is that the, the circles that are edged in green indicate a change that is a benefit, and the circles edged in red indicate a change that is a disbenefit. And the different colours here, yellow, blue, green, uh, sorry, gold, uh, blue, green, yellow, represent different sectors. 
So this example here is led by the education sector and they decide to close a school um, in, in a large village and to have fewer schools, larger, fewer schools. So they consolidate education on a smaller number of larger sites. And the reason they do that, the benefit, is they say that they will, there will be better educational provision. What they mean is, at a larger school, you can provide a wider range of subjects so pupils have more choice. And also, from the point of view of the education authority, they get some efficiency savings because they have fewer buildings to maintain and modern buildings are more efficient. So from the educational point of view, closing some schools and having fewer larger schools is better for the education and also it can save them money as well. So if we just look at the education aspect of it, it looks a benefit. But when we think about the consequence of that, there are many disbenefits, including for the transport system itself. So there are three direct consequences of closing a particular school in, in, in one large village um, and consolidating on fewer sites. The first is that each of the remaining sites now has more pupils. So each of the remaining schools is larger. And what we find in the UK is that although larger schools may be more efficient educationally, socially, they're often less pleasant environments. The, the teachers don't know the students as well. There can be more risk of, in, of bullying of, of pupils. It's a less friendly environment. And because the schools are larger, when the schools finish, there are many more children hanging out around the school. And this can cause intimidation to people. Just the sheer volume of children can, can be threatening or disruptive to people in the surrounding area. And these negative effects, the bullying and intimidation, actually affect the police service because they get involved in trying to deal with those problems. On the right-hand side, if we close a school in, in a village, then the school not only provided education for the pupils at that school, but outside school hours, it also provided other activities. It provided after-school classes, weekend opportunities for sports and so on in that village. So when the school closes, um, there are fewer social and leisure activities available in that village, which means that young people are hanging around on the streets with not very much to do. And so in some areas, that can lead to more antisocial behavior, and again, that can involve the police as well in having to deal with the problem. For the pupils that used to go to the school that's now closed, they have to travel further to go to an alternative school. And therefore, because they now have to travel further, fewer of them can walk or cycle. More end up going by car, and more also go by bus and train. Because fewer are walking and cycling, this means that those students are getting less physical activity, and therefore some of them are becoming more obese or, or fatter, and therefore that's a negative cost on the health service because they have to deal with the problems of less exercise and more ill health. Because more pupils now have to go by car because the school is a long way away, this puts more traffic around the school, so there's more local congestion, and there can be more accidents in the area outside the school, in the surrounding streets. So that's a negative cost on the transport system and also the health system. And to the extent that more pupils go by bus or train, this puts extra crowding on the transport system, um, and again, makes it more expensive or more difficult for the public transport <coughs> operator to provide services in the peak periods. So we have a system where, at first sight, a policy that has nothing to do with transport is purely an educational decision, and from an educational point of view, may have benefits. When we work through the implications of that across other sectors of society, we can see that that decision may put costs on the policing services, it may put extra costs on the health sector, 
and it also makes it more difficult to uh, have more sustainable transport systems. So the point I'm trying to make is not that we should never close schools, but that any major decision made by any sector has implications more widely for the economy and society, including transport. And therefore we need, if we want to have more sustainable cities, we need to take these decisions in a more coordinated and comprehensive manner than we do at the moment. The third aspect I want to do, I talk quite broadly, first of all about the way we view transport and then the way we actually work with other sectors to deliver transport. I would now like to come down to a more local level and look at city streets and actually see how um, we are changing or we need to change the way in which we think about our city streets if, as part of more sustainable city living. Going back to my first discussion about paradigms and perspectives, until quite recently, our design of urban roads was very much rooted or based on a vehicle-based paradigm. Priority on our urban city road networks was given to vehicle movements through a range of measures, through uh, one-way streets, traffic signal control, and so on. But the general aim was really on the original vehicle-based paradigm. How can we make sure that our city streets enable vehicles to move smoothly and efficiently? And as I mentioned, in main transport planning, we've broadened our interest to think about person trips, activities, and so on. Only recently have we started thinking about these broad, broader perspectives in the way in which we plan and design our streets. Until very recently, there's been a lack of recognition of other street functions than simply moving vehicles around our city. And as a result of focusing too much on streets being just for moving vehicles, we've ended up with poor street environments that are very unattractive physically, high levels of pollution and so on, and also busier streets that, that cause severance, that make it difficult for people to move around the city on foot or by cycle. Recently in the UK and other uh, European countries and, and North America and Australia, there have been a series of new design guides. For example, in the UK, our Department for Transport has produced Manual for Streets. And this has stressed the importance of place alongside movement or link, so that streets are important places as well as being important for movement of vehicles. And so we now need to enlarge our paradigm of the way in which we plan and design streets in order to recognise that streets are both important places as well as important links. And this changes the way in which we look at streets, how we measure performance, how we measure success of streets, not just simply in moving traffic, but much more broadly, how we prioritise in our designs, different things on the street. The sort of design options that we generate, they are different now. And the way we appraise our options, the way we decide which is a better solution, also changes when we recognize the importance of place as well as link on our streets. This slogan here, if you like, at the top, Streets for All, really reflects um, modern design philosophy in, in many Western countries, recognising that our streets are not simply for moving vehicles from A to B, but, but are important places of activity in their own right. And this diagram simply shows a whole number of different people, different types of people using the street for different purposes. Uh, somebody might be shopping in the street, they may be cycling and therefore looking for somewhere to put their bicycle. They may be sightseeing. They may just be driving through the street. They may be wanting to cross the street to get to a shop. They may be accessing uh, services actually provided on the street. They may be meeting friends. They may be chatting or sitting or resting on the streets or next to the street. Some people work on the street, 
Um, there are buses on the street, there are people waiting for buses and so on. So there are a whole number of activities on the street, much more than simply the street being a, mean, a, a place for vehicles to move from A to B. And we can see this change in des design philosophy in the following diagrams. This represents a traditional way of classifying our streets in cities. We might have, for example, a five-level classification, which starts with motorways, which are simply for vehicles, down to arterial streets, and then district distributors, local distributors, and access streets. So a clear hierarchy, but a hierarchy based on vehicle movement. What this new perspective uh, does is to say, actually, it's more complicated than that. There are really two dimensions to our streets, not one dimension. There's not simply the link or movement dimension, there's also a place dimension. That our streets are important places where activities take place on the street or in the buildings around the street. And that we need, in designing our streets, we need to recognise that function as well as the movement function. <coughs> so now we end up with two dimensions, streets according to their place level or place importance as well as their link importance. So each street has two functions, link and place, and the relative importance of each varies according to different types of street. So if we have a five level classification of link, uh, national level roads, city level roads, district level roads, neighbourhood level roads and local roads, then we can do the same with place status. We can think of particular streets as being of national importance down to just local importance. And we classify our link uh, streets from a link point of view from 1 to 5, Roman 1 to Roman 5. And we classify our streets in terms of place importance from A down to E. And you can see quite simply that if we have uh, five levels of link category and five levels of place category, then we have a matrix with 25 different cells, different combinations of link and place importance. And here we can see some examples of what streets in, in a western city, what streets from some of those cells might look like or, or how a street might be classified within that matrix with different characteristics. Starting at the top left there, which in fact is the Champs-Élysées in Paris, where you have a road of uh, great strategic importance for movement but also a place that's of major significance within Paris with leading offices uh, very important shops and so on so that particular street has very high importance both as a link and as a place and we can move right down to the bottom right hand corner where we have uh, a local residential street that only has traffic moving just to serve those local houses and as a place has just has importance for those local residents but is not um, part of the wider city functioning as a place. When we look at an urban street network and we've used this, um, we've used this approach in London and, and several other cities it's been used in, in Australia and so on, then the we decide on the link level based on the existing road classification because most cities have an existing road classification but we can modify that to reflect changes in the, the de facto function. So in other words, in a city a street may be classified as a fairly minor road but it may actually carry a lot of vehicles so we can adjust the classification. Or we might decide that a street that is a priority for public transport or for cycling we would give a very high status to even though in the road classification it may not be seen as very important. When we decide how important a street is from a place point of view whether it's of national importance or local importance then we base that on three criteria 
first of all, the catchment area of the buildings or premises alongside. So from how far away do people come to visit the local shops or to visit a particular church or some other building? We also take account of the archaeological, architectural importance of the adjoining buildings. So if the buildings on the street were built by a famous architect or have some great historical importance, that would also give the street a high place level. And thirdly, the cultural importance of the street itself, because in most cities, some streets have great cultural significance for people in that city. And again, that would give it a high level of place importance. This um, illustration here is from part of the street network in London, where we've been carrying out a study with the local authority, looking at all their streets in their borough, and we divided the streets into 2,000 different sections. And for each of those sections, we've given it a, a link classification and a place classification. And you can see that the centre uh, part there, the, the coloured inside the, the road, is the link value going from 1 to 5, and the colour on the outside is the place uh, level or importance going from A down to E. And what you can see is a lot of streets actually are only of local importance, both from a link point of view and a place point of view. So the green, the ones that are all green uh, carry very little traffic and as a place have importance to the residents living there but don't have a wider function within the city as a whole. You can see here sections of uh, street which are red in the middle, which means that from a link point of view, uh, they are roads that carry large volumes of traffic or high numbers of buses. And then there are other uh, roads where you have a red on the outside, wh which are major shopping streets, but don't necessarily carry very much traffic. So sometimes a street may be important both as a link and a place, but in other cases it may be a major link and not so important as a place, or it can be really important as a place and not so important as a link. And the point is that um, as these circumstances vary, as the importance of link and place varies, so the design solution for that street also needs to vary. Here's a very simple example of uh, two sections of street. Both the streets are roughly the same width between the building line. The distance between the buildings in both these streets is roughly the same. But as you can see, the layout of the street, the design of those streets is very, very different. And we can give a rationale for that by saying this one on the right-hand side here is classified as 2D, so level 2 for link, but only level D for place. So a very important street for movement, but no, not such an important street for place activity. It just has a local church and a few local shops. So in that situation, more of the available space is given for movement. Although there is a, a bus lane here that off-peak, outside peak periods, is used for parking and loading. So there is some variation in design during the day. On the left-hand side, we have a street that is classified as 3B, so less important as a link, but more important as a place. And so the space between the buildings, much more of that is used for, for activities or for design that benefits place activity. So there is much more space for parking and loading on both sides. The street is much narrower and there is opportunity for pedestrians to wait in the middle of the street. 
there is more emphasis on lighting and more emphasis on greenery and making it an attractive environment for people to come and shop, spend time and meet their friends. If I just want to return for a minute to, to methodology um, and to the way in which we measure things and, and understand things, and I want to contrast Lincoln Place. The link function of streets is something that highway engineers have understood for 50 or 100 years or more. And highway engineers are very good at designing for the link function of streets. And in terms of moving traffic, we have full design standards. We know exactly how wide traffic lanes should be. We know about turning circles and so on. We have a full understanding of how to design streets for vehicle link movement. We also have many quantitative performance indicators. We know how to measure success from a link point of view. We know how to model vehicle flows. We have traffic simulation models enable us to model in detail how vehicles move along different streets as we change the design of the street. And we also know how to evaluate user benefits, how to make a business case for investing in link in streets. We, we know how to measure value of time savings and things like that. And notice that we don't actually measure the value of a bus lane, we measure the value of time savings and use that to decide if it's worth putting in a bus lane. If we contrast that with place, we've only very recently given attention to place, so we have much less um, understanding. We don't have full design standards, we just have partial design standards. There are many aspects of place that we think are important, we don't really have standards for designing for that. If we have performance indicators, they tend to be qualitative, not quantitative. People say this street feels pleasant or this street feels unpleasant. We don't really have a way of quantifying that. How do we model place activity? We don't have a way of modeling place activity in the same way that we model link activity. And if we want to measure or evaluate providing for place, we don't really have a very good way of doing that. We can evaluate particular features. We can, in England, we can say how much it's worth providing a bench or a seat, but we can't really directly measure user benefit. On the link side, we can value time savings for vehicles moving through the street, but from a place point of view, we can't value the time spent there because the measure of success for place is that people want to spend time there, whereas the measure of success for link is that people spend less time there. And we don't yet know how to value the time people spend in places or how to value the quality of their experience. So on the link side, we can trace our understanding of link right back to our focus on a vehicle-based paradigm, and we have that well understood. For place, which is more about activity, it's more about quality of life and community. We value these things nowadays, but we don't have the same tools to be able to uh, design and justify them uh, to the same extent that we can the link function. And this is an area for research and understanding. Okay, just a few brief conclusions. What I've tried to do in this presentation is to show how the transport profession is influenced by paradigms just as much as the medical profession or, or physics or chemistry. We are influenced by the way in which we approach a problem. And as our working environment has changed as transport planners, so the need, we've had a need for paradigm enlargements. <coughs> We started off trying to accommodate more and more vehicles in our cities. Eventually, we realized we couldn't provide enough roads, enough parking for every vehicle, and so we redefined the problem. First, to move people, not to move vehicles. And then second, to actually say, as planners, we're concerned with providing for activity, first of all, 
and in some cases we can do activity with little movement. We can minimize the need to travel. And this broader understanding is very important for us achieving more sustainable lifestyles. But to do that, we also need to recognize the importance of cross-sector influences. Most of the pressures of the transport system originate outside transport. And many of the solutions to transport problems rely on working with other sectors. If we want more sustainable mobility, we have to work with education sector, health sector, other sectors to provide new opportunities for living more sustainably. And finally, even though our understanding has improved greatly over the last 50 years, there are still as some aspects of behavior that remain unexplained. And I want to leave you with a chart that you might like to think about. This diagram here, on the left-hand scale here, the left-hand axis, shows uh, thousands of vehicle kilometers per capita per year. So this is, on average, how many uh, thousands of vehicle kilometers uh, people, uh, sorry, vehicle kilometers, rather, uh, per capita per year. So these are the actual numbers, sorry, in uh, total kilometers per person per year in a vehicle. And this along here is GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita. It's not a time scale, but it's roughly a time scale because generally GDP goes up year on year. So what this graph does is to show for the average person uh, per country how many kilometers per year they travel in a vehicle. And not surprisingly, over time and as GDP has gone up, so the average amount of travel per person per year in a vehicle has increased. Partly because we have more cars and more vehicles, partly because we have most, more motorways, more opportunities to travel, partly because we have more money and more opportunity to, to travel and to spend uh, money and going to different places. But what we can see is that um, while GDP has carried on increasing, over time in most of the developed economies, the growth in vehicle mileage per person per year has actually leveled off. Um, you can see this, for example, in Japan, the bottom one here, the, the circles here and the yellow line. You can see that um, above about 25,000 um, US dollars a year per capita, there's been no growth in uh, vehicle kilometrage per person. And you can see this in many other countries as well. Uh, in Australia, uh, you can see it in France, you can see it in Germany, you can see it little to less extent in Italy. And perhaps most surprisingly, if you look at the United States here, um, you can see that relatively recently, before the recession, because this data only goes up to 2006, 2007, there's been a leveling off in growth in traffic kilometers per capita, even in the United States. Now, from a sustainability point of view, this is really significant. Um, for 40 years or 50 years, year on year, people have been traveling further and further in vehicles, mainly in cars. This shows that that trend over the last 10 years or so has leveled off. We don't know why. Uh, most of the models that we normally use for forecasting that rely on growth in GDP and so on, growth in car ownership, would expect that trend to have continued upwards. It hasn't. We don't know why, and yet it's really significant because clearly if this is a, is a, is a new trend, if the growth has stopped, then this gives us more hope for more sustainable uh, mobility in the future. If it's a temporary phenomena, then we could be going in the wrong direction again, and if we look at the graph from Australia, the square here, there's even a sense that perhaps we may even be tipping over and going down slightly. And in the UK, for example, our forecasts of traffic growth, um, even though traffic has been levelling off in the UK, our forecasts still assume historical growth. 
and therefore we're planning our future motorways and, and other requirements on the base of, basis of continuing growth in traffic. We don't understand why traffic has stopped growing. All our work over the last 50 years has not enabled us to answer that question, and yet that question is really crucial to our future's planning for sustainable mobility. On face value, it looks very promising that we no longer have to worry about fighting against the growth. There is a levelling off, and maybe in the future, there will be the impossibility of encouraging that to go down slightly. But I would suggest that's one of the big unanswered research questions and one of the big challenges for the future, to capitalise on this stopping reduction or the, the ending of growth and the possible reduction in vehicle use as a contributor to more sustainable mobility um, in our countries and cities. Thank you very much. <laughs>